Hello, good morning. How are you? Uh, thanks for listening again. A few people say, keep sharing, keep doing this. Uh, so uh, I, I will, uh, maybe uh, one or two a week uh, and uh, just to keep it going, uh, a little bit of a chat. So uh, I always tell you about any books I've got. Um, I've got four books the other day, but I won't bore you with the details of those. I did get this, which I find really valuable. It's Chums, how a tiny cast of Oxford Tories took over the UK. It really is quite fascinating and I kind of wanted them, you know, sort of mixing in that circle, if you like. <laughs> I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. And uh, and I thought, let me find out a bit more about who these people are. Because, you know, ultimately when I started getting to chat to a few people who have ex-Oxford and ex-politicians, um, or ex-politicians, they, you know, I got on quite well with them. <laughs> but I'm sure they got on well with lots of people. But I wanted to find out more about uh, what makes them tick. So that book, now, 11 out of the last 15 Prime Ministers in the UK, 11, post-war, all came from Oxford. All came from, not Cambridge, not anywhere else, Oxford University, one university. 11 out of, it's phenomenal. Four people who didn't. Uh, Churchill, uh, Callaghan, and Major, who never went to university. Uh, and the last one <coughs> is Gordon Brown, who went to Edinburgh. Um, so, I mean, for me, I don't like that. I don't like one place just, you know, generating all of the country's, you know, uh, politicians you know, at the top end. So, you know, we need change there, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you know, we should be sort of encouraging that change. In fact, next election, make sure you don't vote for somebody in Oxford University. <laughs> Sorry, Oxford. <laughs> I know you're good guys, but we need a change every now and then. Now, one of the things it's actually saying about it, it's written by a guy who's uh, Simon Cooper, who is currently working, I think, is with Financial Times. He's a journalist, so he but he was there. He was in amongst it. And one of the good things he points out is that they actually don't learn it. They learn to be, they grow up and learn to be great debaters. That's how they do it. Words. They, you know, they, they learn to actually, you know, talk about subjects they have no idea about. They didn't do maths, they didn't do physics, they're not scientists and engineers that get generated that. They're blustering idiots, for want of a better term, do you know what I mean? They are people who are great to stand up, very intelligent obviously, very well educated in a, a number of subjects, but they get up and they talk about you know, put on the spot and then they're able to talk about their particular subjects in a very articulate way. So, you know, that, that's something, it's a skill, you know, and, that, and I think part of the problem is the skill has to start earlier um, and, and you've, you're already too late by the time it gets further down the line. Um, I'm sure if I stood up against anybody from Oxford, you know, they would knock me down uh, without any, on any subject. Apart from maybe, let's get them into cyber security or infrastructure or something I don't really know about. <laughs> and then maybe I'd knock them dead. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so that's the power. And um, But it starts obviously earlier on. It starts at uh, maybe, I think Boris went to Eton. And I think you know, they were basically saying that they're encouraged to break rules. Well, <laughs> yeah, well there you go. <laughs> the problem starts there. And, uh, and so therefore, you know, our di different education systems breed different individuals um, but they've definitely Oxford have definitely had the power um, for for many years and uh, that's very interesting to know anyway and the reason I'm talking about that is I went to there's a couple of politicians or people in that that sphere I've been uh, connect, connecting with certainly last week and, and before and I want to talk to you about them first one was I went to uh, Sir Alex Younger so I went to security first conference last week which was really good uh, it, Integrity 360, I think they're the company that organise it, and they basically, um, you know, get suppliers to sponsor the event, and the suppliers are like maybe about eight of them, all in one one floor, um, and and they presumably pay for the privilege of getting in front of, you know, CISOs and other people who are interested in cybersecurity. Um, so uh, it's very, you know, it's fascinating. Now I didn't know Sir Alex Younger was going to be there. I, you know, I didn't look at the detail of the agenda. I thought, let me go along and because it's, you know, I've been to a session before where. It was useful for me, ultimately, in terms of opening my mind and keeping myself, uh, you know, sort of looking at new ideas, etc. So I thought, let me go along to this and find out more. 
Uh, and Sir Alex Younger, who's the former chief of MI6, uh, was standing, and he's a Scotsman, would you believe? You know, so he even quoted Rabbi Burns. <laughs> um, so yeah, fantastic. I mean, I was like uh, amazed by the guy. Uh, he, he spoke a lot about uh, China and Russia, uh, things that I can't really you know, relay. I, I, you know, I've taken notes about them, and uh, and then certainly there's uh, there's some uh, opinions that he has that I w I would like to have as well. You know, from a per perspective of being. Uh, uh, a British uh, subject and uh, and I think that's more important than anything else like uh, who you work for and uh, etc so you know there's there's elements of what you said that were worrying that actually contradict some of the uh, opinions out there and uh, so uh, yeah uh, I won't go any more than that but you read up a bit more um, but uh, the other thing I, that I was I was hoping to ask him I asked a couple of questions but but uh, one one thing I was asking too many questions at one point because I was the only I was the first person to ask a question. I thought, all oh, right, okay, because once you start, you think, oh, I can ask another question. And so I asked the second one, and I thought, no, I better give other people a chance here to to uh, to speak. And so I was like, but hold on, I want to, I want to find out more about Pegasus, uh, what his thoughts were. Um, and if you don't know Pegasus, you have a read about it. Um, a bit of software sits on. Uh, Apple and Google, uh, uh, it's been around for a while. It was uh, implicated in uh, the Khashoggi murder uh, and it's really bad stuff, it's out there. Um, but it's only supposed to be in government hands. Now, recently, um, uh, 10 Downing Street announced that, well, in fact, it wasn't them announced it, it was a Canadian company announced that 10 Downing Street had it within their sphere. Um, and, you know, that's obviously, you know, a bit too close to home. So I wanted to find out a bit more about you know, just where it is and how, what his thoughts were on it. But somebody behind me asked the question before I did, <coughs> which was great. You know, I didn't need, need to be, the, you know, asking, the, the, you know, hogging the actual mic. Um, effectively, what he said is we need to stop commercialising this technology, which is a simple answer, but, you know, it is, it is true. And I was quite pleased to hear his, um, that A, he had a view, which, you know, he should have, uh, and B, that uh, um, it, it was anti uh, you know the selling of it, you know, because they they basically license it to the is the Israeli government. Well, they, they license it to governments via the Israeli government, and so they're it's all authorized the the release of it. Um, and I'm sure that's only one. I'm sure there's many of them that they've got that we actually don't know about, and uh, Pob probably sitting on the the phones of politically important people, etc. So it's one to look out for. I think uh, on the most part, I think the software has. Um, has had the vulnerabilities fixed by Apple, and Apple are actually suing the company NSO. Um, but uh, you know, that, that, what we see in the surface is, is literally it's like the, the you know uh, the Titanic and the iceberg. Uh, you know, we're only we're only seeing what's it, what we we can actually see. Um, but uh, the, so so the other keeping going on this. Um, I went to a Palo Alto dinner, so they invited me to a dinner in the evening with uh, three tables at the top of the Gherkin, and Lord Philip Hammond was doing the, the little chats, there was only about 15 people over there, and Lord Philip Hammond was talking about the hybrid working, and basically, to cut a long story short, you know, he's, he's seeing a major correction next year as we you know, from an economy perspective, because we can't keep going this way. Um, you know, where you know the ripple effect uh, on businesses and you know, and you know, ev our society as a whole, because we're not back at work, um, is pretty significant, and it'll take a correction at some point. So you know, such as such as that point, um, yeah, which is massive, and, and I'm sure it'll create a lot of debate. Uh, you know, for over the next uh, 18 months. Um, but what he did say, he actually told me a little story. He said, when I mentioned I was with Sir uh, Alex Younger, so because, you know, the Palo Alto MD introduced uh, uh, Lord Philip Hammond uh, to, to me uh, and a, a few others, but then they started another conversation, so it was just myself and, and Lord Philip. And uh, he then started, I said, oh, I was at Sir Alex uh, Younger. Um, uh, I was at a conference this morning and Sir Alex Younger was there. Oh, I know, I've got a story to tell about him. <laughs> He's Scottish, isn't he? I said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah. We the, we went to the fort. Apparently, the you know the fort is where you know MI6 people go to train. And he they went there, and you know he um, he was it was a role play thing. And he was basically and he was actually a nominated VIP. 
So he was in the car and he said, right, this is the role play. We're going to be, you know, taking you through um, the scenario where you, you get attacked um, and from all sides uh, and you're in the car. So fine, all right. So you get bundled into the car, put down, and he's like, okay, this is role play. Next thing he hears a lot of noise, you know, guns firing, etc. And then it's over, right? And think, okay, fine. So he was walking past this kind of shooting range where his car had actually passed and he noticed holes in it. And he said, what are those holes? He says, yeah, they're bullets. <laughs> this is a, and he puts on a Scottish accent when he talks about Sir Alex. He says, aye, we don't mess about here, he said. <laughs> so this is supposed to be a role play thing. He's thrown it in the deep end and actually there's live rounds going. So he, he tells it in a, in a, in a nice way though. Uh, but I said to him at the end of the evening, and I said, I'll, I won't tell anybody about your story. <laughs> And he just laughed because it, you know, it's a, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, sort of top secret, high, you know, highly inf you know, classified information. It, it kind of told me in a way as a, as a, as a nice story. In the same way that Sir Alex Younger is very open and told a story about, uh, um, you know, I think it was in Moscow he said, and he had to choose who, who, who he had to become, you know, a character. So he became a, a, a playboy, a Greek playboy. He chose to be uh, with a South African accent, <laughs> and he said he enjoyed it so much that. It, the, uh, they had to call him and pull him back in. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure their work is a whole lot uh, uh, tougher than, than those kind of stories. But anyway, um, so there's a couple of things I wanted to speak about. Strategy and suppliers. Uh, I've done 11 minutes, so this is probably going to go to 15 minutes, so bear with me. One, strategy paper. See what, you know, I've done, I've been involved in a few over the past organisation, not this one only, but the one I've been before. And strategy papers, from a project perspective, we kind of just say, yeah, we do the strategy. But actually letting people go and, and, and you know, experts um, and run with a strategy, you know, is a little bit dangerous. You need to time box them. I found that you need to rein them back in because a strategy could be endless. It's like you're putting something, you know, through the the local property you know approval process you know just it's like endless it just when does it end and so you do need to time box these things and so so often i think strategies get left with you know technical people and and you know the number of, and sometimes they get you know they leave the organization somebody else has to pick it up and then they do the same and it doesn't actually get delivered uh, in a good time frame to be useful in fact you've actually delivered the technology before somebody's come up with a strategy so you know one of those things that, and that's something i've got a challenge with at the moment so looking at uh, how we can actually get something time boxed and, and and I did this with an external supplier. I'm thinking, hold on a minute, I'm spending a lot of money on you and you're away talking to Joe, Fred and everybody about you know, different subjects. No, no, and I, myself and my, uh, one of my colleagues, Will, um, we, we got him, you know, uh, uh, this particular consultant, you know, sort of you know, t boxed as to doing what it, what it was that we wanted to get out of it. And that particular one was successful. But I've, I've seen others where external suppliers actually don't deliver what you really want um, and so you do need to keep close of those big thinking very important strategic and architectural thinking that goes into those documents so you know don't let it loose uh, too important for that uh, and so so i would always assign a project manager or somebody um, who, who knows you know delivery is important and actually get you know you seeing that document as a delivery not something that's actually outside of a project but actually inside you know, with timelines and making sure that uh, they've got the right sign off and they've got the right process and because often these documents have to go through layers and layers of sign off so where's the timeline for that you know don't give don't give me like oh uh, uh, sometime uh, next month or la end of the year you know no time box right uh, off my uh, soap soapbox for that one next one is suppliers I've always seen suppliers as somebody who's useful to uh, tell us more about a their product, but more importantly, the general uh, flow of uh, what everybody else is kind of doing. Because if you're if you're left behind and, and you're actually not, you're going to be the one that's more vulnerable. So you've really got to be making sure what 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 products are um, fit your particular strategy and what products um, are actually you know maybe gaps in your strategy. Um, so knowing not just your not just who you're dealing with on a regular basis, your current suppliers, but you do need to open your mind to external suppliers as well. Um, 
So uh, on that, with that in, in mind, um, now I ran a conference, I mean, I've got notes down here. You don't know what you don't know, right? So you need to keep an open mind on that. Now, I ran a conference, a cyber conference, uh, when I was at Lloyd's. Uh, it was about, um, I worked in the commercial banking department. So it was basically to help educate um, our clients because of our clients at that time, Lloyd's, if, if our clients actually um, do not uh, have a good cyber posture, cyber security posture, um, in terms of you know just you know, being robust and making sure they've got the good defensive capabilities. Well, if we don't have that in place, we're going to lose them as a customer at some point. So, uh, as an example, Maersk, um, who were one of our clients, and they were actually up there talking uh, as a case study. I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but it was chaired by Lord Blackwell, um, who at the time was chairman of Lloyd's, but he's now a conservative politician. Um, and he said to me during the break, he said, you're well done. He said, you know, because I'd actually set it up and, and the project management, project managed it effectively. Um, and uh, he said, look at how engaged they are. Uh, and he, sure enough, you could just, you know, I saw him, he was at the back uh, uh, of the room next to me, just looking at all his, his customers effectively, uh, you know, um, within commercial banking. And now they were just listening to this guy from Maersk talking about, you know, how they had to reinstall, you know, 4,000 servers um, uh, and how, how they had to uh, resort to WhatsApp for communication. I mean, it was uh, you know, not not a good uh, situation to be in. That was uh, 2017 and not Pe Petya uh, was the uh, um, the ransomware that, get, that hit them. Uh, have a look at you. Know, so you've always, don't forget, you know, at the moment, we're, there's not been any massive big ones that hit everybody, well, apart from Log4J, but that, that wasn't, a, that was a vulnerability rather than an attack. Um, we've still yet to see uh, attacks forming out of that one. But have a look at, at some of the case studies because it does remind you that, you know, we just, we're just, in, we're in that sort of void at the moment, uh, in between uh, the next big attack. So, yeah, have, have a look. Um, and also at Lloyd's we did digital stand-ups um, and I got Google to talk about search uh, because I was implementing their search appliances at the time um, and, I, uh, uh, and I, so I, in essence I'd encourage you to do more uh, of you know innovating and brainstorming with suppliers and, and opening people's minds in your organization because you know they're probably working full speed ahead 100 mile an hour on current projects or, or you know firefighting whatever and, and they, they need a break from that. You know, heads up, just having to have a listen to this guy for a, you know an hour, and, uh, and and then that will help them relax, open their mind to different ideas, and maybe come up with something different in a strategy or a different solution or uh, something to help them do their job better on a daily basis. Um, as a side note, actually, uh, the Google sales director introduced me to his mate called Sajid Javid, uh, and, and he was soon to replace Philip Hammond at Ch as Chancellor and Lord uh, Philip Hammond uh, reminded me of that uh, last week. He said, because I mentioned, uh, oh, I, I met Sajid Javid once. <laughs> and, and he said, oh, well, he replaced me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, when I met uh, Sajid Javid, because um, he, he invited me to PMQ on a Wednesday, um, and because uh, I, you know, I thought that was a good thing to do. I'd, I'd been before, but when I, um, it, and I gave him a Commons pen. I bought it for a fiver at the gift shop, and uh, and uh, it was I think it was less than a tenner anyway. But he was a little bit embarrassed and said he'd need to log the gift. Um, so uh, it was actually quite uh, quite interesting. You know, I was just doing it as a, as a nice thing to do, but he's getting all worried. <laughs> Um, but the uh, PMQ is a bit of a treat. I would really recommend it. You can go to your, your local MP uh, and you can go sit up uh, in a gallery and a, with a big screen. It's, I think it's a bulletproof screen or something like that. Um, I think somebody I think somebody threw eggs or something like that. I think it was some big event that basically uh, somebody had uh, uh, caused disruption uh, from the gallery and you know you can't actually do can't throw things unfortunately. <laughs> Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, uh, one thing, so all that's leading to basically 
what I'm thinking of doing is something internally, um, but it would be nice to do maybe externally at some point, is monthly sessions where you've got you know, internal speakers, maybe people in your projects, whatever you want to you know, have uh, more information on that. Uh, external speakers, um, uh, you know, including maybe existing suppliers, uh, but also new suppliers, because you've got to you know open the door to them, uh, and uh, and that's one way to actually you know sort of you know learn what you don't know. Um, I might do one at, uh, uh, monthly uh, uh, externally at some stage, um, but and that but that would need to be uh, virtual because it you know. It would have to reduce the cost and uh, on all the organisation. But in the meantime, Security First is a great quarterly event, and I'd recommend you taking a look at that. It's uh, uh, run by Integrity uh, 360. Right, two last things. UK Cyber Network. Um, I've just set it up. It's ukcybernetwork.com. It's a place to post educational PDFs, keep people briefed. Um, presentations, maybe supplier news. I mean, I'll keep posting there as a, a useful catalogue of items, uh, which might help in a future event for you. Perhaps if you think uh, you need a bit of information on strategy, or uh, perhaps you want to find out where that article was um, that was on my my feed at some point. Well, I'll always put it on there, and uh, that way you can always come back to it. Um, you, you can join up as well, and and you know share your own stuff. You know, I mean, I've not. I'm trying to make it collaborative, uh, so feel free to come along and join me. Um, uh, because like LinkedIn, you know, like most platforms, gets a bit noisy um, and less personal. So I'm trying to, and and this particular app is based on a platform called Mighty Networks, and uh, I use it for three or four other things in my in my social world, like film and theatre and all that. Uh, and I use use them to distribute uh, to people maybe job jobs and opportunities and. And uh, it flashes up, you know, and they get, a, you know, a notification, uh, and uh, you know, or in their inbox, you know, it's up. They can configure it. It's quite a good tool. And last thing, Lowland Radio. Um, I always uh, do. Uh, I've got two at the moment. One, one I've done. And it's up, uh, uploaded. It's uh, it's about us men with our insecurities, and and it's all about how to strengthen our mindset. And that's called feeling good. Uh, and today I've got a female version to do. Uh, I'm not sure what it's going to be called yet, but I want to open, I mean, it's not just for women, but it's also for us men to think about women in the workplace uh, and how we maybe can help women more, I don't know. Um, uh, so, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm taking advice from my wife and I've sort of went through the playlist this morning and said, well, wow, that's not empowering enough. <laughs> Okay, so, so I've changed a few, and uh, but I, and I've made it all women. There's no, there's no, there was one I was going to call it uh, the female of the species. You remember that track? Yeah? The female of the species is more deadly than the male. <laughs> and uh, but uh, that's a that's a male singer. So I, th I thought, no, I, I I need to get rid of that. So I'm going to call it probably something like I'm every woman, uh, based on the track Shaka Khan, which is probably one of the most powerful. Um, uh, you know, female uh, songs out there, uh, certainly in the, from the 80s. But obviously, there's a, there's a lot of others, Dua Lipa and uh, Taylor Swift. But I also want to talk about what Davina McCall. Um, that there's a program out at the moment. She's, uh, you know, talking about menopause, uh, and I think there's a role for us men uh, to communicate about that as well. Um, so, and it's a, such an important message. Actually, a lot of women are actually. Uh, struggling across the country at the moment because of shortages in HRT uh, and it's not funny it's not pleasant uh, but as men we need to open up our mind because it's a bit closed at the moment and it's making women feel more vulnerable certainly I've had uh, you know stories about that already um, from uh, my wife who's a, a, a head of HR so she's kind of familiar with uh, that in her environment so I want to talk about that and I want to basically see what us men can do about that alrighty right that's all uh, 23 minutes and that jeez sorry about so long <laughs> hope you enjoyed it see you next time